yeah, obviously generative AI completely changes the game. It also, you know, deep fakes and um, other, you know, other tech that's emerging and getting better and better means that making sense is, um, again, increasingly psychedelic because you cannot be sure that what you're seeing is um, what it appears to be. Hello and welcome to the Naked Dialogue podcast. This is episode number 50. Today we will have a conversation with Alexander Beener. Alexander Beener uh, has researched shamanism in South America and Africa. He has campaigned for legalization of plant medicines and the expansion of religious freedom. He has also contributed to several major newspapers and journals. Beyond the Basin is his first novel. And he is also the upcoming author of The Bigger Picture, How Psychedelics Can Help Us Make Sense of the World. He is also one of the founders of Rebel Wisdom, a popular alternative media platform that ran from 2017 up to 2022 and explored the cutting edge of systems change and cultural sense making. As well as publishing regular essays and articles on his substack, he is an executive director of Breaking Convention. Europe's longest running conference on psychedelic medicine and culture. And he also co created and co facilitated a legal psilocybin retreat called Regenerative Stewardship. Well, hello, Alexander. I hope you're doing well. Uh, you know, recently I was watching your lecture on psychedelic sense making um, and its tools for navigating through a psychedelic experience. Uh, and in a slide, you mentioned uh, set setting dose, but you also mentioned the term the matrix, which is really interesting because uh, I think uh, it's an amazing construction of ultimately the process of integration. Uh, like after having an altered state experience, when one is, you know, back to the sober state, they find themselves in this matrix exposed. Um, and they also notice the, you know, the absence of the filtering system, which are normal consciousnesses. Um, so, you know, there's that difference that a person is, you know, perceiving. Um, so all of this, you know, kind of ties up to, you know, how psychedelic sense making works uh, as a broader system. So I wanted you to comment on, you know, what psychedelic sense making is and also how it is impacting, uh, you know, some of the things that we're going through in our, in our culture today. Yeah, sure. So, um, I'll talk, uh, maybe I'll talk about matrix just briefly first, just to, um, explain that a little bit. And then I'll talk about psychedelic sense making more broadly, um, because they kind of link together. Um, we yeah, matrix matrix actually is a word. So traditionally in, in psychedelics, um, the sort of study of it, but also, um, the tools that people use to, to make sure they can navigate a psychedelic experience safely is set, setting, and dose, which people might be familiar with. And if they're not, set is your mindset. So, um, you know, how you're doing, your inner world, where, what's going on in your life, your thought patterns, um, all, everything. Um, and then setting is where you are. Uh, but I would say that extends beyond just like whatever room you're in or where in nature you are. I think setting also extends more broadly to the cultural setting um, and the cosmos. So it's, it's much broader than, than it might be used often in the scientific literature. Dose is, is just how much you've taken. Matrix is a different construct which came from a researcher called Betty Eisner originally who uh, was uh, involved in some of the early psychedelic research in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and she noticed that people um, did better after their, in this case, LSD experiences when they were with other people who were part of that, who had a similar experience so that they could kind of share with each other, make sense of it together um, and, and really have like a shared reference point. So Matrix is then also used a little bit more broadly uh, to, to mean the cultural matrix that we're in, you know, so what is the actual what are the rules of the game that we're coming back to and what are the general assumptions all the way from metaphysics through to epistemology to, to pretty much everything of the culture we're in? Because that's going to be very often, if in, in most cultures, um, not the same, doesn't hold the same value system as the values we may tap into on a psychedelic experience. And so that often causes a, um, a disjoint. Um, so psychedelic sense making is a term I uh, made up <laughs> to bring together. Um, so sense making is really figuring out what's going on, uh, to, to put it really simply. It's a, it's a dynamic process of, um, of interpreting information 
analyzing it, acting on it, but it's not just a cog, it's not just a mental process, it's emotional, it's, it's kind of, um, I'm a big uh, adherent of 4E cognitive science, which kind of um, suggests that, you know, our thinking doesn't just happen in the head, it's an embodied process, we're embedded in, in the world, it's always involves some kind of action as well, and it's also extended through each other, so it's much broader than just how we think. Uh, so that means that, <clears throat> so the psychedelic experience is, it, it's got a bunch of qualities that make it really useful as a, let's say we could say training ground, but I think it's much more than that, but I'll just use that for simplicity for actually figuring out how to make sense of a very complex world that we all inhabit. So the, the psychedelic experience, for example, is high salience. So it's really a lot of information going on all at the same time. You feel more, you see more, you hear more, you interpret more, you can think multiple thoughts at the same time. It's all very intense, um, you know, intensity is sort of the name of the game. And it's also got a level of complexity that is gr much greater than um, our normal experience. And also different parts of the brain are exchanging information that wouldn't normally, or at least wouldn't normally in the way that they do. And so it's, it's sort of multifaceted and lots of different um, aspects of experience are overlapping at the same time. So if we can make sense of that experience and, and travel through it in a way that leads us to greater insight, then my theory is that we can apply those same cognitive and emotional tools like mindfulness, um, discernment, curiosity, openness, courage, um, and we can apply them to making sense of what's going on in the world right now, whether that's culture wars, whether it's... Um, the rise of seemingly intelligent uh, AI um, or seemingly, let's say, conscious AI, but certainly the experience of encountering seemingly intelligent entities that may or may not be real, but have an impact on our lives is a real hallmark of particularly the DMT experience and psychedelics. And so there are all these parallels. In, in a lot of ways, the world is getting a lot more psychedelic. And so um, we have this amazing opportunity to look beyond just mental health and look at how psychedelics can help us um yeah make sense of the world uh no that's a pretty good uh summary of sense making in general but also in relation to psychedelics and you know what matrix is and also you know you just mentioned the word salience uh you know psychedelic sense making also helps in the extraction of relevance from salience uh you know in that lecture you claim that we live in a hyper salient information ecology um which was interesting idea again uh because salience mapping um you know helps decenter ourselves um so you know the current informational era is filled with people trying to you know decipher the truth try to look for the truth but they're often limited by their own ideological fixations so you know like how do you think an average per an average person can you know develop tendencies to you know observe both the content and context of their environment but from an unbiased and a non-reactive manner yeah it's a really good question um i think the really simple answer for me would be stop believing things um i really borrowed that from terence mckenna um who in uh, people aren't yeah terms kind as a psychedelic philosopher and wrote um a lot of good books including um an account of true hallucinations i believe and it's not yeah i'm actually now forgetting mckenna but yeah a bit, an account of an experience he and his brother dennis mckenna um had um in la Chorera, so and they were out in south america and encountered some you know took some mushrooms and had this very extended really deep kind of peak experience um and there's this line in that that the mushroom says to McKenna uh, that he, he recounts, which is where he goes, why, why, why are we the ones being shown all this or having this experience? And it says, because you don't believe anything. And I always remember that, you know, um, you know, regardless of whatever layers of meaning are there or how personal it was to him, I just think it's a really cool idea. Um, and I've tried to test that idea a lot to be like, can you go through life without having beliefs? And I think we have unconscious beliefs, which are pretty difficult unless we bring them into mindful awareness to kind of question. But I think overall, um, it's safer to go by direct personal experience and then check that against the direct personal experience of other people for kind of a collective sense-making process rather than just believing something. So if you believe something, then immediately from, from the salience landscape, from all the things that are calling for your attention, 
you're going to naturally be drawn to particular instances of it, which is fine, it's natural, but what you believe is going to dictate what you go towards. So if you don't believe things and you have multiple possibilities that you're holding of what could be true, then you have a lot more flexibility because you can move in different directions. If, for example, you are, um, let's say, just like a hardcore libertarian or a hardcore whatever-ism, right? any kind of ideological fixation, you can't actually see, you have a particular frame on reality and you can't actually see beyond that frame because there's too much cognitive dissonance and it's, it's a challenge to your sense of safety in the world and your identity. Um, and so you're going to get only be able to interpret information unless you can let go of that in some way and make a new frame that's wider. You're just going to interpret whatever usually supports your existing bias. And that is just extremely limited. It's also arguably what causes um, depression. You know, um, John Verveke uh, talks about the work of Mark Lewis, who's a neuroscientist, who points out, who talks about this concept of reciprocal narrowing that in addiction and, and you know, perhaps depression, it's that our frames on reality get so small, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, that the only like a few ways of thinking and behaving um, become everything. And so the process, John Ravakia suggested that if there's a reciprocal narrowing where we get stuck in this rut, then there's also a process of reciprocal opening where we get more and more expanded, which I think is, is absolutely true. And it maps onto the psychedelic research and the work of Robin Carhart Harris, where he, where he he looks at psychedelics as basically breaking us out of maladaptive behaviors and patterns. So these kind of deep, like fixated ruts of thinking. It's exactly what they do. They help. They break frames, and then they help if we use if we integrate well. They can help us build new frames. But that that part is the hard part: building new frames that are not self deceiving. Of course, they're always going to be self deceiving in some way, but are as unself deceiving as possible. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Robin Carter Harris, uh, you know, you were in the DMTX trials, right? Uh, yeah. I recently read the Substack. How was that experience like? And do you really think that the study would be able to map the DMT realm as they're claiming? Uh, yeah, um, the, the experience was really fascinating and really profound. It was a lot more. Um, so I had four five dosings but four one was placebo so four doses of intravenous dmt um of of um progressively stronger doses they were i was actually part of the dose finding trials there were just nine of us on experienced and healthy volunteers to find what is the um, optimal dose and everyone on the study now which is wrapping up very shortly another 30 uh, about 20 20 something people have done the single dose that we got at the end so we were the guinea pigs for the guinea pigs so that means, though, that there's only nine people in the world who've done it in that way. So I feel very privileged around that as well. Um, it was what was fascinating is that it was both deeply healing on a personal level. I had really profound and profound insights, and very similar to ayahuasca, in, except much cleaner and crisper and more direct. Um, that were very much around, you know, me and particularly my. Um, my vulnerability and level of intimacy with others and myself feeling my emotions fully dealing with, you know, particularly like intense sort of intractable solutions in, in my life, or intractable problems rather, and trying to kind of find right relationship with them. So very psychedelic and very healing. And then the final dosing, and that what I really learned was that like this in the DMT world, there's this kind of, and it's Terence McKenna's fault. And this is something I think he was flat out wrong about. He's like, oh, you go through all your biographical material and you kind of, that shit doesn't really matter. And then you um, you go into the hyperspace and it's all metaphysical and you're there to explore. Um, I don't think that's true at all. I don't think I don't think there's any way to separate the metaphysical and the, bi the biographical, the personal. I think they're interrelated. Um, and my experience is very much you have to go. In fact, the DMT told me it's like you can go to hyperspace and explore, but you have to, you, you have to take your baggage with you and your bags are wide open and all your emotional stuff is like... You know, it's kind of like open and spilling out. You got to close them and kind of get square with them. Um, and that was very much the experience. And so, in the final dosing, um, I mean, it was all metaphysical. There were lots of fascinating entity encounters and just you know, absolutely mind blowing experiences, which I which I talk about in my book. Um, but then the the final dosing was uh, what we might call more traditionally metaphysical and very much sort of inquiring into the what is the nature of this realm, what is the nature of the DMT space, and um, got actually some really fascinating, you know, potential insights to explore. So the second part of your question, can you map that space? 
nobody knows. I'm really fascinated by all of us who are on the study or involved in the study. We really nerd out about that question a lot, right? Like, because the, the first, the first assumption of that is that we're going to the same place, which I think we are. I think we are from all the reports, from the thousands of reports of, of people, there seems to be a consistency uh, to the kind of realms we enter on DMT and a consistency to the kind of entities that we encounter. Um, so I think we are to some degree going to the same place to the degree that if you and I both go to Paris, we're going to come back with different stories about like, Hey, what's Paris like? Um, so in that metaphor, can we find something like the Eiffel tower in the DMT space where we're like, Oh my God, we can reliably go to this place. Um, I ju I'm just reading right now. I actually just suggested this in, the, in a WhatsApp group I'm in with lots of um, people in the DMT world uh, around, you know, because we're always kind of riffing on these questions. And I'm, I'm reading this book right now by Adrian Tchaikovsky, who's a brilliant, he's won the Arthur C. Clarke sci-fi prize. He's a brilliant sci-fi writer. I'm a big fan of his work. Um, and his latest series called Shards of Earth. I'm going to explain it a little bit and it'll all become clear why I'm explaining this and why I think it's relevant to mapping, right? So... Uh, in the book, um, human, like basically there's these huge planet size and like moon size entities that have like, they, they've destroyed earth and no one knows why. And like, no one can really contact them. They like basically like, reform planets into like artistic pieces, but like kill billions of people in the process. And the way that people travel faster than light is going into what's called unspace. So like the nothingness of beneath the universe. And there's these, um, the people who can navigate it. Uh, really well are called intermediaries and they're sort of like kind of not quite genetically engineered but like they go through these brutal surgeries to be able to do that and they're um and the the architects which are the big aliens that that kill planets they come from unspace right so they figure out that they can con they can make contact with them the intermediaries can make contact with them and they manage to stop them killing everyone uh by by saying like hey we're here like through empathy like hey you're actually killing people and that works for a while, but then they come back and the whole series is like, okay, what are they going to do now? Now in the last book, it's really fascinating because they have multiple art, uh, multiple intermediaries trying to contact the architects who have now come back and are like killing planets. And so they're like, it's safe. It's more reliable if two do it at the same time, because then they might get through and they're going through this very DMT like space in, you know, kind of like under the fabric of reality. That's like timeless and weird. And like, and then the way like the way they do it in the new book is they're like, okay, let's make a decision tree because you kind of lose each other in the space as well. And I was like, that, that's a really fucking cool idea for DMT exploration because the decision tree is like, if you encounter this, do this. So it's like, if you encounter this kind of entity, respond like this. If you come into a massive open cavern that has an orb in the center of it, which is where I always go when I start, it's like, go in this direction, like look up and go straight. So if we could do that and we could agree a decision tree where we guarantee like, okay, we're, we're at least going to do the same decisions as each other to the T, right? Which you can do with DMT because you have agency in the space and you can train, you can train to increase that. Um, then that would be fascinating to see what happens. It might be that nothing happens. And we're like, that was a total waste of time. <laughs> Everyone's just like, it's just fucking chaos. But I have a sense that it, you could get somewhere with it. And even if we encountered the same thing a couple of times, that would have been more data to be like, okay, fascinating. How did we get there? What do we... So I really think this is an amazing technology that, that we could use, but it also requires us to be able to, um, like an astronaut has to train, you know, uh, a lot of different capacities to go to space, to be able to navigate that space, you have to really train a lot of capacities in yourself, including deep emotional work, deep relational work. So it's kind of like being an astronaut of the psyche, or of course, psychonaut, that's where the word comes from. But I think it's, it's about like also moving beyond the old ideas we had about DMT uh, and, and including our emotional reality in it. Like any kind of decision tree or mapping is going to have to include our emotional reality because we have, we go to a different place if we're feeling different is, is my sense. And in fact, that was my anecdotal sense because I knew a lot of, you know, I know a lot of the people who were on the trial with me in the dose finding trial. I know about more than half of them. And we've, we've chatted after the trial and it's been really interesting to be like, you know, oh yeah, my second dosing was unbelievable. But then another you know, friend of mine, he'd had a shitty day and his, his was shit. Couldn't really get into it. <laughs> so it's like, that really matters. We need to figure that out too. 
So yeah, you know, like talking about doses, do you think the more the dose is in terms of potency, the better visual experience there is in psychedelics? I mean, in like for DMT, it is definitely not true um, because it's a very short acting drug. Um, but for LSD, I feel like the more micrograms you could increase, the more, uh, you know, the period of peaking uh, extends. And so yeah. it's almost as if you're having a DMT experience, but on LSD. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, no, that 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 usually is the case. Um, although there are some people who don't report visual hallucination, and they, that's not really they have much more embodied kind of emotional experiences, even on higher doses. But on the whole, yeah, I think you're right. Like that, that generally seems to to, to be how it tracks. Um, and I've also heard people describe very high dose mushroom experiences, like um, like DMT. I've heard quite a few people say that actually. Yeah. So yeah, it, it might be true in regards to dosing. Um, also, the entities part is also very, very interesting because Carl Jung, you know, he talked about archetypes. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, if Carl Jung would have been alive when psychedelics were on rise, uh, you know, he would have definitely commented a huge deal on it. Um, because, you know, our collective unconscious is obviously accessible to us during the psychedelic experience. And that's where the archetypes are coming into life. Um, and a new decor culture where you came from, you know, who you were, all of those metaphysical questions that you have. Um, so, yeah, generally very interesting. Uh, but, you know, one thing that really fascinates me is the connectivity between um, psychedelics and creativity. Uh, mm. You know, I think creativity is an important as uh, asset to sense making also in general. Uh, you know, the cognitive flexibility is definitely um, enhanced uh, during a psychedelic experience. So information changes across contexts um, and this constructive fluid reality, you know, under the influence opens up a person so much that creativity just becomes a bonus point uh, to, the, to the psychedelic experience itself. Um, so, you know, what do you think about the link between creativity and psychedelics and also the aspect of creative knowing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely a topic close to my heart. Um, I mean, I, I do think that creativity, I think it, yeah, I think I know what you mean about it being a sort of, um, it's like a bonus point, and it is, but I, I also think that creativity is deeper, because I think it's like, a, it's like a fundamental quality of the universe. And in nature, nature is deeply creative, right? It's, it's, it's finding new solutions to problems. Um, and there's also something even deeper about creativity, which is, I think, like, um, the emergent life force of reality right there's something like there's a kind of well of creativity at the heart of things uh, in my um in my experience so there's that aspect of it and then there's of course the what you're saying is that psychedelics and actually my wife um ashley murphy binder did research on this with ayahuasca um ayahuasca increases cognitive flexibility and mindfulness scores as well um and i think that's pretty probably true across the board with psychedelics like you you and cognitive flexibility like the ability to think flexibly is probably at the heart of not just creativity, but also mental health, the mental health impacts. You know, I interviewed a guy, not very non, not at all involved in psychedelics, um, professor at Columbia called George Bonino, who wrote a book called The End of Trauma. And his whole argument in that is that um, basically the most effective, uh, the people who do best at navigating coming out of traumatic experiences are those who are most flexible. So flexibility is really closely correlated with um, good outcomes um, after, uh, you know, just, you know, an emotionally damaging experience. Um, it's a little more complex if you have you know, complex trauma where your whole childhood was absolutely horrific. That's still kind of, I think there's, I think it probably still tracks, you know, it's like how fluid and it might be like trying five or six different treatments, you know, doing like it's, um, again, it's just like, difference between the rigidity of, you know, depressive state compared to like the flexible fluid state of psychedelics. So I think they're really closely linked together. I really like what you said about uh, creativity and sense making as well, because I think that is absolutely true. It's like, um, it, it gives you access. I mean, I think creativity is on largely in terms of human experience, always the ability to combine two existing elements to create something new. And that's, I, I'm big into the work of a guy called William Duggan, uh, who is actually also at Columbia, I think, but in the business school. Um, and he talks about this, this concept of strategic intuition that we have an unconscious, we have all this information in our unconscious, 
we can add to it by reading, by absorbing stuff. And then we have presence of mind so we don't try and solve the problem. And then new ideas come in like eureka moments, like in the shower, walking the dog, and it just hits you from your unconscious. It's like, hey, boom, here's a new combination. Um, it's really difficult to find an invention or a new system of thought or a new type of art that isn't that, that hasn't taken what came before it, combined two or more elements in a new way, and then then it's like, you know, most of it doesn't work. <laughs> that's the thing. Most of it just didn't work, right? And it's like, no, no, that, that's a shit combination. But the ones that did, like, you know, Impressionism or Cubism or Google or so many other things, they came from pre-existing things. Google was AltaVista plus academic citations. It was literally those two things. Downloaded, they downloaded all of AltaVista. They applied a new algorithm, which was just the most cited thing goes to the top, the least cited thing goes to the bottom. And that, that was Google. And of course, the algorithm has advanced since then a lot, but the principles are kind of the same. Um, so, and there's, there's just so many more examples. I love trying to uh, deconstruct what new and what novelty looks like from that, from that place. But so with that in mind, you know, in a psychedelic experience, you have so much access to unconscious material. And I think that process is happening really fast. I don't think anyone's done like the research into creativity and psychedelics. Um, it does sort of map onto this. I, I, I did a piece recently on my Substack about AI and creativity where I spoke to, um, a neuroscientist called Maria Ballet, and she, um, yeah, she talked about this pretty well, so people can check that out, because I can't remember exactly the terminology she used right now, but um, yeah, the kind of like convergent and divergent thinking, and um, you know, they, they have that, these these kind of models of what, what they think creativity is, um, that kind of, you know, loosely map onto the, the model I was just describing, but I think practically you just have so much information to work with and ideas are popping in and unlike with real life some of those ideas are ridiculous and then you after your trip you're like no nah, that's a mad idea but then some of them are world changing and some of them are like you know really really powerful and important so yeah i think the two things really really go hand in hand psychedelics and artificial intelligence the connection seems very very interesting so i'm looking forward to checking that source out um uh, which also you know reminds me wh what do you think about you know daniel schmachtenberger's ideas around uh, uh information matrix that we live in and also how we are actively defining or you know making meaning of the experiences that we're having um like uh we have so much misinformation biased information uh weaponized information um but our brains are always actively trying to make sense of all of it across all sorts of different contexts um so, you know, broadly, like, what do you think about the impact of, let's say, misinformation on culture today, uh, which is assisted by technology? So it is technological um, to a higher degree um, and is often pushed nowadays through artificial intelligence as a tool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty disastrous in a lot of ways, um, you know, especially with yeah, obviously generative AI completely changes the game. It also, you know, deep fakes and um, other, you know, other tech that's emerging and getting better and better means that making sense is, um, again, increasingly psychedelic because you cannot be sure that what you're seeing is um, what it appears to be. I'm not going to say real, but I think everything is real in the sense I'm, I'm kind of an idealist so I, um, um, or a panpsychist, so I think consciousness is primary. And so from in one sense, when we say, is it real? Um, I think uh, from, from our particular perception it is, but then also it doesn't mean that if I think I'm a purple elephant, I actually am. So I think there's different kind of levels of reality, but uh, that's kind of an aside. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's hugely problematic because it's, it creates a crisis in trust as, to add to the crisis in meaning. So we don't actually know what information to trust we also don't really know what institutions to trust we don't actually know what people to trust in the online world i don't even know if it's a person at this stage it could be an ai you know it could be an ai chatbot that i'm talking to so that creates a potentially really um a bad trip in the sense of losing our center and losing our connectedness to a sense of the real and what's solid and what is verifiable i think it makes it increasingly important to have that and i a part of that is i think embodied experience is real and your your experience of the world the fact that you're having an experience is real doesn't mean that everything you're experiencing can be verified with other people or is real in that sense that requires group sense making and that requires us to have 
basically just a very good level of discernment and also the tried and tested ways of finding truth as a group. So testing our propositions, um, you know, being aware of the inherent biases in our own cognition and in the, in the systems we're part of as well. Um, I think probably it's more important to, um, focus on the systems level because we could be amazing sense makers, but if we're in a, um, you know, as Schmackenberger points to in a race to the bottom multipolar trap world where there's a kind of warfare and information and the whole system is not designed for truth seeking, then we're just, it's an uphill struggle that we're probably as individuals really, really not going to win. So I, I'm, I'm increasingly, um, yeah, I'm increasingly drawn to the idea of, um, how, how we create, build, uh, new systems. I mean, it's also massively difficult because, um, you know, one of the debates in that is, okay, well, do we create new institutions, for example, and throw like get rid of the old institutions? And I don't personally think that's going to work because institutions, um, take a very long time to form, um, and are very kind of, you know, like for example, the media or our health care system. So it's tempting to be like, we're going to do something totally new. It's all going to be holistic. It's all going to be completely different. It's going to be a different finance model. It's going to be different, everything. Um, what tends to happen and from what I've observed is that we just run into the same problems that people ran into like in the 1800s when they were trying to make these institutions and then they have to work around and you start realizing like, oh shit, actually the workarounds are pretty smart because the, these are perennial problems with say journalism or with um, whatever it might be. Like if you look at like journalism, for example, where we're getting our truth from, if you look at how journalism worked in the 1870s, I mean, they didn't give a shit about truth seeking. I mean, it was awful. It was like really kind of all over the place, tabloidy, not, not everywhere, but like it was, it was actually considerably worse in a lot of ways. Like institutions evolve over time and we, we have things like checking your sources and, you know, giving right of reply and, and all of that, that doesn't, that, that comes out of like hard work. So basically in some way, I think we need to reform our existing institutions to, to bring them up to scratch with a completely, completely different world and a different level of human consciousness. Um, and that just requires, I don't know exactly what that requires, but it certainly requires people in those institutions and in places of power um, starting to think and feel differently. Um, so I don't think you can just give everyone psychedelics. I don't think that works because they just, you just get tech bros being like, oh, I need to invest more in Bitcoin. And it's, it's, uh, it's not as simple as creating these individual experiences. It's just like designing new systems very explicitly um, and new games to play. So, um, yeah, and I think we're all, a lot of people in this space are trying to figure out different ways to do that. And it's uh, hard as hell, but possible, I think. True, no, I agree with you. I, I often worry about AI safety myself a lot. Um, because you know what we've we've had so many advanced AI systems come out so far that it's uh, not insane to think that artificial general intelligence might be might you know much closer than we have, we would have imagined. Um, you know, kind of going back to you know the topic of psychedelics. Uh, you know, your new book is coming out. Um, the bigger picture: how psychedelics can help us make sense of the world. So, what are the chapters and sections of the book like? Yeah. So, I mean, the main the overarching argument I'm making in the book um, is that is something I mentioned earlier, which is that the skills and capacities and insights um, that that we gain on psychedelics and also what psychedelic science is revealing and psychedelic philosophy are kind of exactly what we need right now to make sense of of the world, to make sense of a world of runaway AI, of um, of the of the meta crisis of all these overlapping crises we're trying to figure out how to solve i don't think they're the solution to everything but i think they're a really important tool so the way i structured the book is um the first chapter and i also running through that are my experiences on the dmt extended state trial um and so i kind of i weave the um the personal and the the, you know, the bigger picture stuff um together I, I would say it's probably about 70 Five percent sociological analysis of where we're at and how psychedelics relate, and maybe the the remaining percent my own personal experiences, um, which was an interesting process in the writing process to figure out where that balance was or or should be. Um, I read a lot of yeah, I read a lot of different really kind of diverse um, first person sort of journalistic accounts to kind of get a sense of it, uh, which was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, so the first chapter is. Um, it's called Strange Drugs for Strange Times, um, and it's all about 
um, looking, taking, you know, introducing people uh, to psychedelics. I don't go into the in, the entire history because um, I don't, I didn't. Well, that was not the kind of book I wanted to write, but I want to give a good, solid foundation of, you know, the history of psychedelics, why this, why now, the indigenous usage, and the psychedelic renaissance, and then looking at how do psychedelics actually change how we think and feel and perceive. Um, so I, you know, draw on the work of yeah, Robin Card Harris, John Verveke, you know, many. I think I have, I think I've referenced probably two, two hundred people in the books. There's a lot of different uh, from lots of different fields, and of course, I spent five years a. Uh, um, uh, through rebel wisdom interviewing super intelligent people which was made it much easier to be like okay yeah i want ian mcgillchrist here i want this person here so um and then i have you know so so in that chapter basically I'm, I'm kind of making the case for that and i talk about my first dosing on the trial the next chapter is called the big crisis and that's my word for the meta crisis but i wanted a different word for a more mainstream audience to be able to understand it because meta crisis sounds really like it's just people are like what what does meta mean you know, that's just usually what I think most most of us go to. So I call it the big crisis. But it's if, if people are familiar with the concept of the meta crisis, which is all these overlapping crises that we're facing at the same time, the sort of like crisis of civilization, that's what I'm looking at. And I'm kind of like looking at the different angles of it from the meaning crisis, the environmental crisis, and where psychedelics apply to each of those. Um, and also taking, taking a critical look, like, for example, you know, a lot of people, there's studies out, a lot of people see... Um, psychedelics as being sort of not like eco agents, like they make you naturally more ecologically minded. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it's partly true, but I think it's a lot more complex than that because um, they could also deeply connect you to the city you're in. You could have that experience. I think they're much more, um, uh, the, the phrase ecodelic um, is, is probably better there, which is that they, the idea behind that is that they connect you to whatever environment you're in. Also, there's um, a lot of people who are, who are already ecologically minded take psychedelics, and there's the whole remnant, there's the whole kind of um, 1960s kind of hippie movement, and the environmentalists that sprung out of that. So it's a very culturally specific. I think psychedelics are extremely culturally specific, um, but at the same time, I think they have tremendous potential for helping us reframe our problems. So that idea of reframing our problems and looking at them more from different angles, I think that's that's kind of one of the arguments they're making there. Um, chapter three is all about the internet and AI, and also uh, my second dosing, which was really wild dosing. Um, and that's actually one of my favorite chapters. Um, and then chapter four is all about darkness, like the dark side of psychedelics, from psychedelic capitalism to the kind of delusional states we can get into, to the capture by the multipolar traps of um, late stage capitalism, and, and a lot of other um, yeah, a lot of other, you know, identity politics, all of the, all of that stuff, which was the hardest chapter to write. One I'm kind of most, one of the ones I'm most proud of because um, not a lot of people are talking about that in, in great detail, um, especially in the media. It's all like, it went from like uh, LSD makes you jump out of windows to like LSD resets your brain and cures your depression in one dose. And neither of those are true, right? It's just kind of like the media are so bad at talking about psychedelics. Um, so the, next two chapters are very much around how to build a new social game um, or ways that we could start approaching building new social games using the um, insights from psychedelics so they're much more the kind of looking to the future and um, also include my final dosing in there um, as, as some kind of narrative thread and color um, and i also look in that at um, the what people are using psychedelics for beyond mental health treatment because i think that's something i really wanted to explore in the book so for example um, my friend Leo Rosman, who was also a participant on the study, he's an Imperial College. Uh, he's one of the original people in the Imperial Psychedelic Research Group, um, and he's done this amazing study on um, uh, groups of. Originally, it was groups of Israelis and Palestinians who happened to drink ayahuasca together in the same groups, and then he took it further and he took them out to Spain, and actively did ayahuasca ceremonies that were focused on conflict resolution. And I happened to live next door to him while he did, was doing that. So I, I got like the kind of first interview discussion when he literally came back from Spain. I was like, do you want, could you tell me what it's like for the book? Because I was already writing it. And it was, it's just fascinating. He hasn't published it yet. But um, that, you know, that's one of the things I found really interesting. It's like everything with psychedelics is, 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 is complex and rich. Like you're like, okay, let's do conflict resolution. And the reality of that is, and I kind of extrapolate on this to look at like the, the, psychedelics in the 60s and why that didn't work, um, et cetera, it didn't have that complexity to it. Um, but, you know, in his study, you had 
there are these moments of like deep unity where it's like we're all one the conflict is really just like you know like a lower level of consciousness and we're all like kind of singing kumbaya and connected and then like an hour later someone starts singing in arabic and it triggers the hell out of someone else and then it's like hey they're gonna work with that now like this whole thing is woken up and then that also like he really he points out really well how that whole we're all one can very easily mask political realities and be a bypass and so the real the real work is to just really go into those realities and that's the that's a big big theme in the book and out of my own personal process over the last 10 years is um you got to do the work you have to go into those dark places you have to wrestle with yourself you have to um there's no bypassing there's just no bypassing you can never bypass you can really just only process and go through and then you get to the other side but you've got to and that makes you stronger and that makes you happier and it makes you more wise and more compassionate that process um and so i yeah i'm very critical of the sort of new age and sort of yogi psychedelic kind of expressions of like you know light workers and all of that i think it's 98 percent total bypassing money making bullshit um and so i also want to kind of um critique that a little bit. I don't critique that that heavily in the book, but I do kind of uh, nod to it. Um, so yeah, and then um, yeah, again, the final chapter is very much around like, you know, where next? Where can we take this, this, these kind of things next? You know, and certainly not providing any sort of like grand solutions of how we're going to save the world. Um, it's much more lines of inquiry um, and why psychedelics could, could really help us do that. I also include a lot of sense making um, tools and tips and practices uh, in there. So the, the kind of, I really wanted to include some practical elements that people could, without even taking psychedelics, that not, because not everyone needs to go, okay, well, what do we learn from psychedelics and how can we apply those with non-psychedelic practices in our lives? Because there's so many different ones. So I include a lot of that too. You know, it makes me wonder, how can you uh, understand what is perception under the influence of psychedelics? Like, how do you look at perception? Because perception definitely changes a lot when you're under a psychedelic influence, uh, you know, in general. So, you know, there's this concept called hypnagogia and mm. hypnopompia. So, you know, you get these visuals, uh, you know, in your sleeping state. You're almost about to go to the REM sleep stage. So you get these visuals and all. Um, so you know, it often makes me wonder the parallels between, broadly speaking, psychedelics and spiritualism. And, you know, how mindfulness and kundalini yoga could also be the tools that take you to the same DMT level that a single changa dose might just do. So, you know, what do you think about the similarities and the differences between both of them? And, and which one would you prefer the most if, if there is a preference there? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I really thought about this or think about it a lot. I think, um, actually, it's interesting. I worked with a uh, coach called Trish Blaine coach and facilitator. Uh, I've been working with her for like more than three years. And when the trial came up, like she really specializes in navigating altered states. She's, she's not heavily psychedelic. She's, her focus has been on like group processes, Tantra and other practices. Um, but I was like, uh, I was like, Trish, would you help me um, prepare for and integrate and navigate? So, you know, I'm an experienced psychonaut, so I could bring the kind of specific psychedelic stuff, but that was incredibly useful, partly because Trish has a model called the four forces, which is the, the idea being that we have these four basic desires that we're often trying to get met. So connection, we want to connect, we want to love and be loved. Um, expression, we want to have our unique expression. Um, growth, which is we want tomorrow to be better than today. And we want to kind of like, you know, kind of expand. Um, and then purpose, like we need a direction, we need things to mean something. Um, and she then maps these onto different state, peak states as well which is super helpful because they're all different. And I don't think we go to the same place from a Kundalini experience that we go from DMT. And the example is because, so um, connection maps onto that, the sort of Zen, you know, Samadhi experience of all is one and I've just dissolved. I'm just one with, I'm one with everything. That's like you're connected so deeply that you disappear, right? So that's like a connection experience. Um, growth is that kundalini awakening of like expansive life force energy like oh my god like sexual energetic like oh my god everything is alive um, and then purpose is much more the prophetic experience like Moses talking to the burning bush it's like it's like there's there's a mission reality has a purpose it's historical it's directed and 
that's an equally powerful mystical experience. Um, and then expression is the experience that probably is my most common mystical experience that I had had before the DMTX trial, which was um, I'm the, the universe all is one and I'm a unique expression of the universe in this moment, the wholeness. I'm the wholeness looking out at the rest of the wholeness, you know. They're all different experiences and they all teach us something different and they are, they are not the same, but different groups get like state um, obsessed. They get obsessed with a particular state being the state. And for example, DMT is a good example of this because NN DMT, which is what I was doing on the trial, is a very uh, prophetic experience. You know, you're, you have agency, you're encountering different beings, you kind of, you can have your, you can travel, you're receiving lessons. And Rick Strassman, who did the first famous DMT study, he wrote a book called DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. And he was like, if you want to understand the DMT space, you, you should read the Bible because it's the similar type of mystical experience that people are experiencing in the Bible. Um, so it's like, yeah, I think that's spot on. 5-MeO DMT is much more connection based, but also I, in my experience, um, <laughs> I'm saying that having only tried 5-MeO for the first time on Saturday and it's Thursday, <laughs> so I'm still integrating it. But what I've noticed in that it was a profound experience. Um, it's very much connection, but all the other forces, like it's basically everything, everything at once, but through the lens of absolute kind of unity with, with reality. Um, the really different experiences and on, you know, on the, on the DMT extended state trial in my final dosing, I had a, I had a mystical experience, which I've never had before, which is the overview effect that astronauts report when they see the earth from space and everything just gets re your perspective on what's matters and what's important and you in relation to reality totally changes. And I had it because I was in this, um, I'd sort of broken through into a, realm which was just really densely populated with ent entities and the message was like this is an ecosystem that human beings are also part of and it's absolutely unbelievably huge like there's an ecosystem of um of alien intelligences um and you know you know yeah beings that is in a different realm now setting aside for a moment whether that's ontologically true or not we don't know I could have just spent my brain on drugs, right? But in a way, it doesn't matter for the experience because the experience was, oh my God, I am so tiny in relation to the rest of the universe. And, but my unique expression also matters. So that's actually a really healthy, I think, mystical experience for people in the West because it doesn't require us to let go of our egos and our, our expression. In fact, our egos can be as expressed as they want to be but they're always going to just be the tiniest speck in the cosmos. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds in some ways. You get the kind of that sense of deep unity and connection and humility with your own unique kind of perspective. And so I think, um, which is probably why it was so powerful for those astronauts, right? It's like some of them came back to Earth and um, really kind of tried to send that message. Um, so that is, you know, there's like so many different types of mystical experience and they all give you a different perspective and, it, and you need different ones at different times and ideally they combine together in different ways. So I think it's really important, especially in the psychedelic world, they talk about like the mystical experience. Um, it's like what mystical experience? Um, Imperial have done a good job. They've created a metaphysical beliefs questionnaire and they've kind of, I think they could go further, but they've basically, we filled it out after we, um, you know, like an hour after the experience. And it would be questions like, it was pointing at like different, you know, it's like, do you believe the reality is made entirely of matter, right? It was more metaphysical, yeah, it's metaphysical beliefs. Or do you believe it's entirely made of consciousness? Like, do you believe, did you have an experience of yourself as a, you know, pointing at you? So they, they don't touch on all of them, but it's a pretty solid survey. Um, so they understand, I think, that there's more than one. But I think in America, it's, maybe this is changing a little bit now, but Traditionally, a lot of the scientists who've driven the psychedelic revolution, revolution or renaissance forward have been uh, American boomers, right? And so they grew up in the 1960s where the, the big thing was Eastern spiritual traditions, which brought with them connection focused, um, all is one, and let's let go of the ego. Um, that I don't think really worked very well for the West. I think it created a lot of bypassing, but I think one of the results was that a lot of them, when they thought mystical experience, they thought that mystical experience. And that's, you know, Rick Strassman even talks about this in his book. They thought they were going to get nothingness um, in the first DMT trial. And they got like loads of somethingness, like loads of something. And they had to then reevaluate it. And the, the part of the problem with that is assuming that there's a mystical experience that we're going for when, when there just absolutely isn't.
there's many yeah yeah you're right you know after integration i think the next step is expression of the mystical experience that you're having um and one of the things that i actively think about is you know how what is this perception that we are directly accessing at all times uh you know unbiased of the filters that the environment imposes on us um so you know what do you think about uh this psychedelic visual perception that we perceive like the hallucinations that we get do you think that there might be an underlying visual um you know within our underlying reality itself or uh do you think it's something else is happening yeah that's a cool question i i think they the feeling i have and i've heard a lot of people say this of seeing for example like hieroglyph symbols on mushrooms or you know on dmt these very distinct geometric shapes they don't feel like something that i my brain is yeah obviously it is my brain doing something of you know as well but it feels that they, they have some kind of meaning to them and some kind of mystery and they're they're sort of seem like they don't care that i'm there they're just what they are um and so I, th I find that absolutely fascinating. Like, and obviously a lot of them are fractal and there's fractals in nature as well. So there's a kind of underlying, I think, mathematical code that we're tapping into. I think it is underlying actually. Like, I think there's something to it, to the, to the visuals. And there's other people who have uh, researched this way better than I ever could because I'm shit at maths. But I know there's there are people looking at this, like looking at those visuals and those patterns and applying them to what we see elsewhere in nature, right? And I think that is really important because it's like yeah i think we are tapping into a different way of perceiving something that is already there rather than um and i think we're also overlaying a whole bunch of stuff on that as well so it's it's it's, it's not black or white it's like a really it's a really complicated thing but yeah there is i mean just i just find it so endlessly interesting that we are all seeing these similar patterns you know and and you know and also the fact that you see you see these kind of hieroglyphs and on, on, on like Mayan temples a lot as well. Like this kind of very Mayan looking and a lot of people report that. I would, I'd be cool if someone did a study specifically on that actually, just to see how many are reporting it, but there is something to it. And there is some sense of meaning in the symbols. I think that's what it is. It's like the symbols seem meaningful and important. That is really fascinating, you know, and the neuroscientists, I mean, their, their explanation for this kind of thing is like when you smoke DMT, when you ingest DMT, you have this kind of total deconstruction of the previous reality and your brain has to construct a new reality. And because we're prone to see agency and um, aliveness in objects, even and in different animals, your brain makes these entities. Um, I don't think, I think it's partly true because I think the way the entities look is partly due to our cultural framework and our projection. But I think the entities themselves and their intentionality and their energy, I think they are real and, and, and exist independent of our perception of them. Um, so, but of course, neuroscience can never say that because it's, it's based on physicalism. It's based on the idea that the only thing that's real is matter. Um, and that's actually, I mean, back, just back to the book for a moment, the, the main, that's the main, um, one of the main things I'm exploring and also that I explored in a recent article about AI is that I think that the greatest gift of psychedelics is that they can help us realign our sense of what reality is to begin with. And actually a lot of people move towards a more panpsychist or idealist view in which consciousness is either a key aspect or all of reality. And I think all of the game, all of the game theory traps and dislocation and lack of meaning and crises that we're facing somewhere down the line can boil back down to our cultural story, which is, based on physicalism. So it's our metaphysics that are broken. You know, Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about generator functions, right? Like what are the things downstream causing the, these, these kind of like um, symptoms of, of collapse, etc. cetera. Um, and so what I do in that article and in the book is like, look at what, what is the generator function of the generator functions? Um, and I think it's physicalism. I think it's the fact that we don't understand that our view in reality is out of date. Um, so I had a great conversation, for example, with Bernardo Castrup, um, around this and it was one of my favorite conversations in the book and, and probably one I one of the ones I use the most um, to, to kind of make sense of this and I'd really apply 
what what the psychedelic experience can steer us towards to okay what would it actually look like to orient ourselves to a different metaphysics because the evidence is is really strong from quantum physics and elsewhere that consciousness is an integral part of the universe and so um why don't we play with starting there first and see what systems new systems and ways of doing things emerge from that different metaphysical foundation there's nothing there's nothing deeper than that um except more metaphysics i guess yeah no you're right um so like one last thing um when when, like how do you so when a person is exposed to the matrix um after having a psychedelic experience their perception about it is definitely vividly changed um so you know apart from let's say the tool of decentering what other tools would you recommend for the person to actually navigate through the matrix after they've had a psychedelic experience yeah that's a good question so i would say um yeah to navigate through through the world as it is after psychedelic experience. And there's a few, aside, so decentering this ability to take a step back and observe the content of experience, super important, but so is embodiment to really come into the body because that's real. Like, and it's as real as it gets because if you don't have the body, you're not perceiving anything. And, you know, so the body and the breath, um, also keeping that sort of psychedelic playfulness and challenge to the existing structure. I think that's always been the promise of like the psychedelic, the, of psych- the psychedelic counterculture, at least in the West in the last 50 years or 60 years has been, oh, this is, um, I'm not a full social constructivist by any means, but because I do believe there are essentials. Um, but I think a lot, a lot, especially of our social games are constructed. And I think that means that we can question those and challenge those while also connecting to what's essential. That's why I think embodiment is so important. You know, it's just like that gives the baseline of like, this body is real. Uh, my biology is real. My perception is um, mine, and I'm having an experience. Those are foundational, real things. And then from that place, um, I can start to deconstruct. But you can't deconstruct unless you have something for everything to fall into. So I think then again, the sacred, staying close to the sacred, that experience of the deep mystery at the heart of things that transcends language and transcends any social games. That's absolutely essential if we're going to be deconstructing anything, because what we've tried to do in the West is deconstruct everything with a cultural story that goes, oh, yeah, by the way, you don't mean anything. You're just like a meat machine that's farting out consciousness as a side product. And the only thing that matters is accumulation. It's quantity rather than quality. That's a disastrous combination because um, you're deconstructing into your own kind of collective hell. Instead, we can deconstruct into what I believe is the truth, that we're part of something deeply mysterious, profound, and and really, really beautiful. And then we can deconstruct safely um, and be like, hey, this particular social reality is bullshit. Let's think of something different and let's kind of slowly make something new instead of the like adolescent deconstruction we've seen since um, Occupy Wall Street, but particularly since 2016 um, and, and onwards. So it's a kind of a much more mature way of being countercultural than than we've really seen um recently no that's that's very very true um so well it was amazing having a conversation with you would you like to tell people where they can find your book yeah sure uh, firstly likewise it really uh, this is one of my favorite ones we got to go deep so thank you um yeah you can find my book on pretty much everywhere that sells books if you're in the us it's everywhere from barnes and noble to obviously amazon um target walmart apparently i could i saw it the other day which is great um but then yeah i mean amazon is is always a, a good go-to and you can also get on audible and you can go on my website um alexanderbinder.com and there's links there or you can just search it in google and it should show up it's called the bigger picture